Welcome back. Thus far, we have read Descartes and all six of his meditations. And we read Descartes' correspondences with Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, and that was our last meeting. Today we're going to be talking about Margaret Cavendish. Margaret Lucas Cavendish, we should maybe specify. Or you can say Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle uh, upon Tyne. But that doesn't even narrow it down because there's another Margaret Cavendish who's also the Duchess of Newcastle on Tyne. And you could say, like, the one in the like mid to late 1600s. And you're like, nope, there's another one by that name at the same time who's also the Duchess of Newcastle on Tyne. So sometimes we'll say Margaret Lucas Cavendish. That was Margaret Cavendish's uh, maiden name before she married the Duke. William Cavendish of Newcastle on t upon Tyne. Newcastle is like way up. I don't know if you guys know English geography at all. It's like way north, far, far away from London. So it's a, a little bit in the boonies. <clears throat> Margaret Cavendish was uh, not born to particularly aristocratic folks, but I guess fairly aristocratic folks. She wasn't poor by any means, but wasn't a princess of Bohemia either. Margaret Cavendish's father died when she was really, really young, and her mother had to take care of the entirety of the state the estate uh, in her father's absence, and did a fairly good job raising the kids and kind of taking care of like the rest of the estate. But one thing that she did neglect and that Margaret Cavendish or Margaret Lucas complained about later on in her life is that her mother didn't really attend to the education of her daughters, not anywhere close to the way that Princess Elizabeth's ed education was tended to. Princess Elizabeth, like, no expense was spared in her education. She had plenty of free time in order to en uh, engage in those sorts of studies and plenty of access to famous people. She could just write Descartes, and Descartes might write back. Margaret Cavendish was in a slightly different position. She eventually worked her way up to be a lady-in-waiting for um, Queen, I think it's uh, Henrietta Maria. She was the, the Queen of England, the wife French wife of King Charles I. In the introduction, did you guys read the introduction in Atherton's Women Philosophers of the Early Modern Period, the introduction to Margaret Cavendish? Kind of tells a little bit about her life, so some of the stuff I'm going to say now might be a little bit redundant. But there's one, possibly one of the greatest understatements that I've ever read at the beginning of the introduction to Margaret Cavendish's section in here. It refers to, what is exactly the wording that Atherton uses? Dun, 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 dun. In the quarrel between Charles I and Parliament. So there was apparent. So uh, <laughs> Margaret Lucas, this is before she met William Cavendish, um, became the lady in waiting for the Queen of England, wife of Charles I. And Charles I had a quarrel with Parliament. This quarrel was called the English Civil War, and it ended with Charles I being beheaded. So, like, that's a hell of a quarrel. It's a really big deal. The royalists who were supporting Charles I were on one side of this English Civil War. There were parliamentarians, roundheads, the folks who were eventually represented by Oliver Cromwell, who became the protectorate of England after Charles I was beheaded. This was, like, a huge deal, by the way. England underwent a total coup in which the king was deposed and beheaded, and somebody else became the ruler of England. It didn't last very long. There was a restoration. Cromwell died, and Charles II, Charles I's son, ended up being restored back to the throne, at least for a little while. <clears throat> and a lot of the folks that we're going to encounter, this incredibly, like, lucky, perhaps, or like incestuous sorts of relationships. Almost everybody that we're going to talk about has some roles in like the Thirty Years' War, the English Civil War, or some of the things that are coming quickly on the heels there. Um, so with Charles I defeated and beheaded in 1649, all of the royalists are pretty much like persona non grata in England. They end up leaving. So Margaret Lucas goes with the queen in exile now to France, where she encounters, who will soon become her husband, William Cavendish, the Duke of Newcastle upon Tyne. She spends an awful lot of her time in France because going back to England is not very safe, at least until the Restoration and Charles II comes back. And after she meets the Duke of Newcastle, William Cavendish, now she has like this incredible access to all of these other people. She rubs elbows and has conversations with Thomas Hobbes, who we're going to eventually read, and who's missing from the first half of the semester, but he could very easily be included. It's just going to be, it would end up being a little bit redundant. But Hobbes has plenty of things to say 
about metaphysics and epistemology and kind of like the nature of matter and how this kind of functions in the way that we'll talk about minds. She also has like plenty of conversations and plenty of contact with Christian Huygens, a kind of like budding physicist. You've probably heard of him. Have you heard of him? Like wave theory. Basic wave theory is Christian Huygens. Um, Descartes, she has some kind of indirect access to. Did I say Hobbes? Hobbes, Huygens, Descartes. Gassendi. Gassendi, who, like, if you ever read Descartes' uh, Objections and Replies to the Meditations, the, I believe it's the fifth set, one of the major sets is Objections that are raised by Gassendi. He's a, he's a fairly big deal as well. Um, Margaret Cavendish, Margaret Lucas Cavendish, seems to be a person who is possessed by just kind of this incredible and insatiable desire to write. Do you have this desire? Do you like, do you like to write? Because i got to be honest, I don't really like to write. It's a bit of a chore. Mutation? What do you mean a mutation? Oh, like it's a mutation to like have this desire to write? She writes all kinds of stuff, by the way, too, not just philosophical treatises, and not like just philosophical treatises in one form. What we'll see in philosophical letters is we've got this weird sort of blending of the meditative approach and the epistolary approach, this kind of letter writing approach and the meditative approach. What we get from Margaret Cavendish in her philosophical letters are these letters that aren't really to anybody. We were talking a little bit before class about how easy it was to miss that in the introduction. You're wondering, like, who is this madam that Margaret Cavendish keeps writing to? It's an imaginary person. There is nobody that she's writing to. It's a diary that's taking the form of letters that she's writing to somebody else, which is an interesting strategy to use. Yeah, Corinne. So was she, like, so every letter was her own writing? So she was kind of, like, contradicting herself in the like, things her yeah, a little bit, although it'd be inter like as we kind of go through this, I read her as, as kind of a little bit vague, a little bit kind of hard to pin her down on exactly what she's saying, but not necessarily going back and forth. I see her as maybe artic like trying to kind of grope around in the dark and eventually articulate one sort of unified perspective. She's got a problem. She's got a real tiger by the tail here. There are a lot of things about Margaret Cavendish's writing, particularly in philosophical letters, that aren't doing us any favors. One is that, uh, and this is, a, maybe this is as a teacher, I zeroed in on this. Did you guys catch this as well when you were reading? Were you thinking to yourself at any point, like, paragraphs, Duchess Cavendish, use them. Paragraphs are hugely helpful and important. She just doesn't use them, just like, just like keeps on talking, talking, talking. Sometimes just sentences that go on and on, and on, yeah, and like semicolon, and the sentence is still going, and another semicolon, and the sentence is still going, and then she'll like finish that sentence, and, and back to the thing I was talking about like earlier, which is like pages ago, you're kind of like, blah, 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 blah. please do not take Margaret Cavendish's actual writing style as anything to model in your own writing, it's I'm sure you found it too, incredibly frustrating to read, and she, it doesn't help that the topic that she's addressing is a very, very difficult one, and the approach that she's taking is very weird, too. I'll go ahead and say it. It's a weird idea that she's playing with. Not necessarily a wrong idea, but one that's very, very unfamiliar. Perhaps not so unfamiliar. You might be thinking to yourself, like, that seemed pretty natural, in which case, cool. You might understand Margaret Cavendish better than I do. Jack. Yeah, I don't know enough about the history of literature to say whether or not this was the style of the time in 1660s uh, England. Well, I just wanted to say it gave me a really big headache. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad that you're here too. I'm sorry about the headache though. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, I recommend that we push through because there is something absolutely fascinating going on in Margaret Cavendish's work here, and I'm, I'm bound to try to uncover it as best we can. I'll also point out that, and I'll be posting some stuff online about this, there's a point here with Margaret Cavendish's philosophical letters and some of the issues that she's going to be raising that we'll talk about today um, that could conceivably splinter off into a completely like awesome and coherent rest of the version of the second half of this class. And it concerns like basic problems of like matter and space and time and causation.
we're not actually going to do that. She gets right that she's like right up on the edge of this big problem with matter and causation and space and time and how these things are functioning. And they're perfectly natural elements in a conversation about early modern metaphysics. To make room for all the other stuff that we're going to be talking about, we skip over that. So there are some figures that like, you might want to pay attention to if this is an interesting idea for you. I know, Pearson, we were talking last semester about space and time as an interesting topic, and I expressed some kind of frustration that it's hard to find really easy sources in the ancient era about this, much easier in the modern era. We're just not really covering it. The closest we're going to get here is Margaret Cavendish. We're going to hit it again with Kant, but there are some interesting figures in between. Folks like Leibniz, folks like Clark, Samuel Clark, and there's a great correspondence between Leibniz and Clark talking about the nature of space. And Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, who's also like, maybe you've heard of him as well. He's a little bit of a big deal. Um, I'll post some resources for that if you're interested. But what I want to grab onto and like the trajectory that we're going to take out of Margaret Cavendish and kind of coming from Descartes and through Princess Elizabeth and then through Margaret Cavendish onto Locke and Hume and Kant is this question of like, what's up with the mind? What the heck is the mind and how does it work and where is its place in this universe? Questions of space and place and causation are totally going to be relevant to this conversation. But instead of chasing those issues as they kind of go through Leibniz and Clark and Newton, we're going to be chasing this question of mind from Cavendish to Locke to Hume and then Kant. A lot of preamble. This is how I fall behind. Descartes. Not going to do it. In meditation one, I'm not going to do that. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. I promise, not going to do it. But I will say this. We remember Descartes was a foundationalist, right? Right? Right. What does that mean, by the way? If you're kind of wondering, like, is Descartes a foundationalist? Something that might help is figuring out what a foundationalist is. Yeah. A truth, yeah. Something, some, some kind of like reliable foundational truth. In fact, we would say foundationalism is like one big branch. It's one of the big options that one can take in epistemology when we're trying to answer this question, from whence cometh the reliability of knowledge? If you know something, like what is it that makes the knowing stronger than merely believing and happening to be right? And one of the things that foundationalists will say is that if your knowledge bottoms out in something indubitable, like if I say, I know this, and you say, how do you know that? And I give you reasons, and you're like, yeah, but how do you know your reasons? And then I'll give reasons for why I know my reasons. If you back me up to a point where I say, here's a foundation that is absolutely indubitable. For example, I exist and I'm a thinking thing. Might be like a foundation that, like, that's completely indubitable, and if I can build off of that, then I've got a model of knowledge that starts with absolutely certain stuff at the foundation, and then other things that are built off of that. That's not the only approach, but it's the approach that Descartes is taking. And it's actually kind of a little bit of a residue of some of like the ancient and medieval approaches to epistemology. This is kind of a little bit of a last gasp of foundationalism that we're seeing here in Descartes that kind of rattles around through a lot of the rest of the early modern era and then eventually moves into some other things. The other thing that we'll probably note about Rene Descartes is that he is totally a rationalist. He's arguing for the reliability of empirical sense data or the sort of knowledge that we can get from, from like our senses. But if that sort of thing is reliable, if the senses are reliable, it's because they're based on a rational foundation. Most of the stuff that Descartes is working with here is not, not about empirical information, right? It's not empirical knowledge. It's maybe about whether or not empirical knowledge is possible, but everything that that's grounded in are just purely rational beliefs. None of the senses are really used, except in like a couple of little moments in the meditations, but they're weird, like when he has the piece of wax and he's sniffing it and he's looking at it and melting it and stuff like that. He's using his senses there, but that's a weird kind of, like he doesn't even know if he has a body when he's doing that exercise. So the, the way that the body has been kind of suspended, or his belief in the body has been suspended for most of the, the meditations, demonstrates to us that even though Descartes got like empirical knowledge in his sights, he's still a rationalist at the end of the day. There are things that can be known through rational capabilities alone without the senses, 
And at the end of the day, these might be more reliable than the empirical things because the empirical things, if they're reliable, are based on these rational foundations. So he's a foundationalist and he's a rationalist. And the last thing that we should know about him is that he's a substance dualist. And he had a cool mustache. All right, four things you should know about him. And we know what, he, what we mean to say a substance dualist, I hope, by now. How many substances are there for a substance dualist? That's the easy question. Three, exactly. Three, no. Two, two. But then there's the mind-body composite, which is the third simple idea. Like, But yeah, the substance dualist says there are two. And for Descartes, what are these two? Res cohetans, which if in English, res cohetans? Thinking thing or thinking stuff or thinking substance. And then res extensa, which is material or extended substance. All right, res cohetans and res extensa. And then we saw Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, and Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia said, yo, Descartes. Hey, isn't there an interaction problem? And I don't know about you, but after reading that exchange, I'm like, there is totally an interaction problem. That interaction problem is, how is it that res extensa and res coetans supposedly causally interact with one another if these are two completely different substances? How does the mind cause the body to do things? And how does the body cause the mind to do things? How does that causation happen? If the mind isn't even extended, it doesn't have any shape, it doesn't have any location in space or in time, it doesn't have any of these modes of res extensa, all it does is think. So what do we do about this interaction problem? And the other thing that Princess Elizabeth says towards the end of their uh, correspondence and we encountered in our conversation on Thursday last week is that it seems easier to imagine the soul or the mind. I'm happy to play loosey-goosey with those two terms, soul, mind, whatever. The Greek word is suke, which usually gets translated as soul, but you can see that the suke, like psyche, right? That's mind. Um, it seems easier to imagine the solar mind as res extensa, as a material thing. And that's where we pick up things with Margaret Cavendish, because Margaret Cavendish is totally saying, soul's a material thing. She's picking up this idea. If you were following along in this correspondence with Princess Elizabeth and Descartes, and when Princess Elizabeth says, almost seems easier to imagine the soul as some sort of material thing. And if you were reading, you were like, yeah, yeah, totally, right? The soul is a material thing. Because there aren't any immaterial things. There's only one kind of thing, and it's physical stuff. If that's what you were thinking... Well, you're in luck, because that's all we're talking about today. Perhaps you're not so in luck, because it's hard. It is hard to imagine just one sort of thing, especially when we start talking about the mind as some sort of material thing. Margaret Cavendish says this. There are kind of some, some basic things that we want to get on the board, and I'll just kind of like head off anybody who wants to hold her to the same kind of standard that Descartes is working from in his meditations. Don't even try. She's not even pretending to hold herself to that standard. She's just kind of jumping into the conversation in medias race. You'll notice that a lot of her is like trying to make sense of other authors. And in fact, she uses that phrase too, like, dear madam, who's not like a real person, and then says, your author says blah, 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 blah. And once or twice she identifies the author as Descartes, but there are plenty of other places where she doesn't identify who the author is. There are a couple of those where it's obvious she's talking about Descartes because she's saying stuff that's like, that's totally Descartes. And then there are other things where it's like, I don't think that's Descartes. There's at least one place where she's talking about Descartes, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't think that's Descartes. In fact, one of the first things that she said, in the first letter that we have in our, in our selections, Margaret Cavendish attributes a belief to Descartes that I'm left scratching my head and being like, does he actually say that? Yeah, the stuff that he has to say about, yeah, motion is like something that I'm kind of like, that doesn't seem familiar. And she's not ambiguous at all. She says, Descartes says this. Now, one of the ways that we can explain this is, well, one of the ways that we can explain this is that Descartes a little bit ambiguous, and there are many ways to read him. In fact, you might have noticed that I've kind of talked as if this were the case when we're decoding these texts. So one way of reading them is this way, another way of reading them is this way. This doesn't mean anything goes and you can interpret Descartes however you want. If you said Descartes says there's only one substance and it's matter, you'd be like, no, no, uh-uh, doesn't say that. Like the text doesn't actually back that up. 
But the text does underdetermine the way we might interpret Descartes, and maybe Margaret Cavendish is giving us one possible interpretation. Another thing, and this maybe is like a bigger factor in this, Margaret Cavendish didn't read Latin. And she and the meditations were in Latin, and she didn't read French. And most of the translations of the meditations around this time would have been in French. And there were no apparently no English translations that she could readily get her hands on. So she had to find people who would translate passages from Descartes for her. So maybe she's getting unreliable translations. Maybe she's getting incomplete translations. Maybe she's taking some interpretive liberties. There are all kinds of possibilities here. And frankly, I don't care. I don't care if she's getting Descartes right, because in the process of perhaps misreading him, she stumbles upon some really, really interesting stuff. Here's a vague outline of kind of like what's going on in Margaret Cavendish's philosophical letters, at least the ones that we have excerpted for our reading assignments and that we're going to be discussing today. And uh, let's start with saying this. Um, we need to, or perhaps we ought to, take a naturalistic, naturalistic approach to the mind. When I say a naturalistic approach to the mind, this, bring, this comes with a lot of baggage, especially for Margaret Cavendish. I say we need to take a naturalistic approach to the mind. Another way that we might say this is we want to take a uh, kind of like almost like a proto-scientific, and I hope I've demonstrated this, or if not demonstrated, at least said it enough times that we're all catching on. There's no such thing as science yet, which isn't to say people aren't doing science. There are experiments and scientific methodology that are being applied. Francis Bacon has laid out a methodology like a long, long time before this, at least 100 years before this. And so like there is science, but nobody's calling it science. Nobody's calling it some kind of special different thing apart from philosophy. Often, awful, oftentimes what it's getting referred to as is natural philosophy. When we say natural philosophy, we, we should maybe, or when a, somebody in the 17th century says natural philosophy, maybe we're thinking to ourselves, oh, that's kind of like what science is today. So proto-scientific in the sense that it's, it's not quite full-blown scientific in the sense that we're thinking now, but it's starting to lean that way. And another way that we maybe, maybe want to think about this is a materialistic or physicalistic approach to mind. Basically, Margaret Cavendish is saying we need to get more scientific about the way that we approach mind. And as I was mentioning that there isn't really any such thing as science just yet, there's also another term that hasn't really been invented yet, but I don't know about you, it seems like Margaret Cavendish is totally knocking on the door. What do we call this? A scientific approach to the study of mind. Psychology, right? There's that suke again, right? The suke logos, the systematic study of the mind. is psychology. We're going to see this from Locke as well. We're going to see it from Hume. They're all going to say, like, we need a more scientific approach to mind. And you're like, that's psychology. It hasn't been invented yet. But you can see these philosophers who are struggling to do something like a scientific psychology with philosophical tools or with kind of like this kind of poverty of scientific tools, at least. Um, so we need to take a naturalistic approach to mind, a proto-scientific approach to mind, if you want to think about it this way, a materialistic or a physicalistic sense of mind. And the marriage of these two is really, really interesting for Margaret Cavendish. She comes right out and says it like this. She says, the only kind of substance that there is in nature is matter. There's only one kind of substance, in nature at least, and that's matter. Which is to say, we can study it with our senses. We can study it in this kind of scientific way, in this naturalistic way. We can use our senses to kind of explore minds and identify certain regularities, certain sorts of patterns, certain sort of like basic behavioral laws that minds engage in and use this in order to study mind just like any other sort of natural phenomenon. You want to study how trees work? Go out and look at some trees. That's how you learn about trees, right? You don't sit in a cabin just meditating to find out about trees. Although maybe mind is different, right? Because you bring your mind with you into the cabin. You bring your mind with you wherever you go. 
So maybe all you do need to do is think about mind in order to discover truths about mind. But Margaret Cavendish is kind of like nudging us in a slightly different direction and saying, look, all nature is material. Maybe another way of thinking about this is that humans are natural. We are natural creatures. Sometimes humans want to suppose about themselves that they're more special than the rest of nature, that we're somehow above nature. I was having a great conversation with somebody earlier today about the difference between what is natural and what is artificial and how weird a distinction that is. And perhaps we have this intuition that like whatever humans do, whatever we touch, that ain't natural, that's artificial. Does that seem about right? Well, especially like man-made things like industrial. Yeah. Things. What are the not natural things? All the man-made things, right? There's a trail through the woods. And humans made that trail. Is that trail natural? Or is the trail artificial? Seems like it's artificial. This is one way of, about, of thinking about humans as somehow separate from nature. I don't think I would. So how come a human's house is, in, is artificial, right? How come my house is artificial, but a bird's house or a beaver's house is not? That's a little bit weird. We seem to be thinking of ourselves as somehow apart from nature. Yeah, or perhaps like I heard, uh, I've heard some people say anthropocentrism, although I think this is not anthropocentrism. It's maybe um, human exceptionalism. We think that we're somehow special or different. And the way that we tend to think about it today is humans as artificial as opposed to nature, which is natural, which I, I'll, I'll kind of warn you, that's a weird distinction and it goes weird places and like maybe figure out how to work through that problem. But the other one that like Margaret Cavendish and Descartes and the rest of the early moderns are dealing with is this idea of humans as natural as opposed to not artificial, but as opposed to supernatural. And humans love to think of themselves as supernatural, created in God's image, somehow like possessing some sort of supernatural. Here's a great example of like humans as somehow acceptable and outside of the rest of nature. Humans have souls. No other kind of creature has souls. Animals are just dumb machines. But humans have this magical, immaterial substance that makes up their thinking selves. And you can't see it. And you can't study it with any instruments. There's no soul detector that'll kind of like measure all of like the alpha particles coming off of your soul or something like this. There is, you can't detect an immaterial soul with any kind of scientific instrument or with your senses because it has no body. It's just not available to the senses. Humans are natural. They're not supernatural. Descartes and lots of other folks that want to elevate humans to something above and outside of nature, they seem to be making a mistake as far as Margaret Cavendish is concerned. She doesn't argue very hard for this. She just kind of like tosses it out there and, and says, there are people who are saying that humans are somehow this kind of different thing than every other natural thing. But it seems like they're not. And if we're going to study minds, human minds, scientifically or naturalistically, we have to think of human minds as some sort of natural thing. And because she hooks up naturalism and materialism or physicalism, because she says all nature is material and humans are natural, not supernatural, this means that minds, minds, that's messy. Come on, get it together, Roosevelt. Minds are material. And this is the thing that Princess Elizabeth just kind of, she got to it eventually by saying, it's hard to think of it otherwise. It's easier to think of human minds as material. And Margaret Cavendish offers us a little bit of a syllogism here to get there, which is to say, all nature is material. There, is, there might be immaterial things, by the way. And Margaret Cavendish is careful to leave this door open, particularly with respect to God. God, perhaps, might not be a material thing. But then again, God is supernatural. Infinite, right? And you don't have to be infinite in order to be supernatural. You just have to be immaterial. Maybe if you are immaterial, you're also infinite. This gets into like other sorts of like metaphysical questions, but like this is how we get off track. So let's not. All nature is material. Humans are natural, not supernatural, despite our like most arrogant kinds of suppositions that we're somehow special and above it all. <laughs> 
So that means that minds are material. There's a way of kind of reversing this statement that minds are material. And this gets down to like the heart and soul, no pun intended, of what Margaret Cavendish is trying to get at. If you had to put Margaret Cavendish's philosophy on a t-shirt in one phrase, and that's unfair, but like if you needed to do it somehow, that was an assignment that your philosophy professor gave you, it would be this. Matter thinks. If minds are material, then that means that matter has to think. Now Descartes tried to do this kind of end round around this, tried to prove that minds can't be material because minds can think and thinking can't possibly be done by a material thing. He offered a conceivability argument for it. He offered a divisibility argument for it. Conceivability argument is in meditation two. Divisibility, divisibility arguments in meditation six, if you want to go back and check them out. Descartes trying to argue that because thinking is possible, the thinking substance has to be a different kind of substance than the material substance. And Margaret Cavendish is cutting that right off at the knees and saying like, nope, minds are material, which means matter thinks. And that leads to all kinds of cool, wacky places eventually. But that's where we're going to end. We're going to end with some stuff about like, if matter thinks, how does that work out? We'll talk about three different kinds of matter. There's only one kind of stuff. Oh, really? What is it? Matter. Oh, oh, there are three different kinds of matter. Oh, shit. Here comes the many different kinds of stuff thing again. Keep an eye out for that. It might be coming back in. We might get the same problem, just re-articulated as different kinds of matter instead of different kinds of substance. But let's kind of take a run at that through some other stuff that maybe was a little bit more confusing. Jacob. How would this interact with the church, with this concept of the church, that souls are natural and not supernatural? Well, for starters... Margaret Cavendish is English, so she didn't give a damn what the church has to say about it. That's not entirely true because she's a royalist and a backer of Charles I, who is Catholic. But like England is always in a kind of a weird sort of a relationship with the Catholic Church and with dogma. You've got like not too, not a whole lot before this. You had the King of England, Henry VIII, basically say like, "Hey, I want to get a divorce," and the church says like, "No, you're not allowed. That's not how we do things." And the king said, "Well, then." I introduce to you the Church of England, which is like my own church where I get to have divorces. The English were always kind of doing their own separate thing with this. And we'll see, they're, they're definitely, I think, a lot more, um, there's a lot more latitude for acceptable sort of religious conversations. You'll notice, though, that Margaret Cavendish doesn't even flirt with atheism or anything like that. She's still totally a theist and a Christian and espouses an awful lot of the dogma but doesn't get kind of tangled up in, in sort of the metaphysical dogma of the Catholic Church. That doesn't really bother her as much. We will get folks who are flirting a whole lot more with atheism relatively soon. I think Locke can be read as like more or less an atheist even though there are a couple of places where he leans heavily on the concept of God. David Hume, that guy was an atheist. He never comes out and says it but it's like, oh yeah, oh totally. Totally. Just read what he has to say about miracles, which is to say, like, he says, like, there aren't any. It's a ridiculous idea. So, yeah, Margaret Cavendish isn't worrying about that, but this is England now. Anything goes, almost. That's not entirely true, but still tons of religious wars going on. But it's a different scene than the, than the continent is. There were some other hands. Yeah, MK. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I use those words more or less interchangeably. Yeah. When I, when I say we need to take, it's like if we want to do a good job, we need to take. It's not like a metaphysical necessity that we must take a naturalistic approach to mind. Obviously, some folks can take a non-naturalistic approach to mind. It seems like Descartes is maybe doing that sort of thing. So yeah, that's what I... We'll do a better job of studying mind if we take a naturalistic approach. to it. Yeah, Corbin. Yes. A rationalist believes that there are some things that can be known through mind alone, which is to say, not the senses, without any sort of reference to the senses. <laughs> 
I think Descartes' coito is a pretty good example of like something like this, something that could be known through mind alone, maybe through mind alone. It depends on whether or not you think the awareness of your own thoughts is a purely mental event or if there's some kind of sensory perception involved there. A dream, yeah, maybe a dream is like kind of imaginary, which is to say, and we saw this in Meditation 6, the imagination is quasi-sensory, right? The imagination is not thinking about math or metaphysics or like saying like that which is is and which is that which is not is not and cannot be. Like you don't need any senses to do that sort of thinking. You don't need any senses to realize that like, well, am I thinking? Well, insofar as I'm asking that question, I am thinking and there needs to be a thinker of thoughts in order for there to be thinking. So I must exist and I must be a thinking thing. That also seems to make no reference to the senses. And that would constitute this sort of thing, rationalist on a rationalist account of knowledge, that there are some things that can be known through mind alone. And most rationalists will tack something else onto this and say something about these are somehow more trustworthy and reliable than empirical routes to knowledge. Rationalists might, I think most of them would, say that like you can get knowledge through the senses, but most rationalists will also be taking aside. Have you ever experienced this, that your senses tell you one thing, but your rational mind tells you something else? Yes. And they disagree with one another? Yeah, what do you do when those things disagree with one another? Cry. You cry, yeah, you cry, you curl up into a ball and you cry a little bit. And then you get up, and now what do you do? Some people might say, we've got to decide which of these two things is more trustworthy. Some folks might say, I'd prefer if these two things were on the same page as one another, so let's find a way to get them to agree. But in a fight between like what my sense data tells me and what my rational mind tells me, if these two things disagree, rationalists tend to put a little more credence on the rational mind and a little less on the sense experience. What we're going to be seeing later on are folks that, that kind of the polar opposite epistemological position to the rationalist is the empiricist. And really hardcore empiricists like David Hume are going to say there's only one way to get knowledge if there is any way to get knowledge at all. And that's through the senses. There is no such thing as things that can be known through mind alone. It's all sensory experience at the bottom. Rationalists say like, no, 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 there are at least some things that you can know through mind alone. And a lot of them will say, and those are the most important things. And a lot of them will say, and those are the foundational things. These three categories don't have to go together, but they find a pretty natural fit in Descartes, such that we might get a sense of like, yeah, I bet you a lot of rationalists are also foundationalists. And maybe that kind of also sets us up to be thinking about substance dualism as well. And what we're seeing from Margaret Cavendish is that I'm not sure if I would say that she's a substance monist because she's leaving the door open for these supernatural and material things, but at least as far as the natural world is concerned, she's a materialist, not a, dual, not a substance dualist when it comes to nature and the natural world. She's a monist for nature and a materialist or a physicalist. No res cohetans, just res extensa. And what we're seeing from Margaret Cavendish also by saying that we should take a naturalistic or a proto-scientific approach to these sorts of things, to study them in their materialistic and physicalistic ways. This is like what Descartes and Princess Elizabeth were talking about too with respect to the mind-body unity, where Descartes was saying, ah, you're talking about the mind insofar as it concerns all of its interactions with the material world. That's like the material profiles of the mind, the material shadows of the mind, or the echoes in the material world of the mind, however you want to put this. <clears throat> and Margaret Cavendish is saying that's all there is to like a naturalistic study of things. That's all there is to nature. And she's also starting to lean towards empiricism a little bit too. This is going to blossom. In fact, it's going to be called English empiricism because it mostly happens in France. No, that's not. Because it mostly happens in England. And folks like John Locke and... Margaret Cavendish and Thomas Hobbes and uh, David Hume, right? All big time empiricists, all from the British Isles. There's a kind of a, a distinct early modern approach to metaphysics and epistemology that starts to list away from rationalism and towards empiricism. And we see it beginning here with Margaret Cavendish. Any other questions before I jump? Because the next thing that I want to talk about are things like place and motion and causation and shape.
and stuff like that. You guys caught those passages, right, where she's talking about these things, and they're weird and confusing. Yeah, Corbin? Are there any modern uh, philosophical thinkers that aren't European? That's an interesting question, that aren't European. Like, there were definitely philosophical thinkers during this period who were not European. They were, like, other places. I might go so far as to say that modernity as a historical concept is a European idea. It was talking about what was going on during this time period in Europe. So I, we might be, if you think modernity requires European during this time, then no, there are no modern thinkers who are not European. But that doesn't mean that there weren't philosophers during this time who are not in Europe. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. That would be an empiricist approach, right? Yeah. But his issue with this is that the senses appear to not be entirely trustworthy. So if the foundation for all of my knowledge is untrustworthy sense experience, then all of my knowledge is also going to be untrustworthy. And he's like, no good. But does he have this like, idea that in the rational mind, there are just some things that are known and that you don't learn hmm. what's in Uh, you don't learn what's in your ma rational mind through your senses, right? This is another idea that, like, we're not going to get here with Margaret Cavendish. It was definitely in Descartes, not as obvious, and I didn't highlight it very well. But with John Locke, we're going to see there's going to be this conversation about innate ideas. So maybe, is this what you're talking about, Corinne? Innate ideas? Ideas that I just, my mind comes, fact, like, from the factory, equipped with these ideas. Descartes does seem to be an innate idea. Uh, I, I, innate, and he seems to adopt a theory of innate ideas, particularly when it comes to God. The closest that he gets to this in the meditations is when he's talking about God, and he says, like, I have not had any experience of God, no sensory experience of God. And he talks about the idea of an infinite being as kind of what being like the thumb mark of his, like the thumbprint of his creator on his soul or something like that, in the creation of his immaterial thinking soul by God, God left this imprint of the idea of God. And Descartes is born with it. Every person just like has this idea. John Locke's going to say, fooey on that. No innate ideas. You're born with a blank slate, a tabula rasa. There's an interesting fight. In fact, there's going to be a reflection draft on exactly that question. Innate ideas, blank slate, which is it? They both have serious problems. All right. Right now, we're on this question of mind is immaterial or mind is material. And we've seen the mind is immaterial position, and then Princess Elizabeth says, it seems like it's easier to think about it than it's material, and Margaret Cavendish says, hold my champagne, I'm going in. <laughs> and she gets at this in a really sort of an interesting way. And I'm not entirely sure what to make of this argument. Maybe you guys can help me out. I find myself in this kind of stage of things trying to figure out what it is that Margaret Cavendish is trying to say rather than evaluating whether she's correct or not or her arguments are good, because I'm still not sure I've got a really good handle on her. But she starts off by talking about things like motion, motion, and place, and shape. What's the context of all these? What is she saying about things like motion and place? It opens up with this kind of like peculiar sort of attribution to Descartes about motion. Did you guys catch what it was? It's in the first letter in our selections, by the way, too. Yeah, Peyton. What is it that Margaret Cavendish is saying about motion and place and shape? She's kind of taking a particular approach to this and trying to make an argument. And if you want to find where she begins talking about this, begins talking about it in letter 30. That's the first in our selections. And she attributes this to Descartes and says, I disagree with Descartes about this. And just kind of like full disclosure, I don't know if Descartes actually says this thing that she's attributing to him, but like, fair enough. Like, we can still follow the argument. It's not abstract. It can be made from motion from body. It can't be distinguished. Yeah, no abstraction can be, you can't take away motion from body is what she's talking about. She's like, there's no such thing as motion without bodies. Does that seem about right? This is kind of sounds like, also sounds right for like 
Margaret Cavendish is a materialist, and she says, there is no motion without bodies. If she is a materialist, no shit there's not going to be any motion without bodies. There ain't going to be anything without bodies, right? It's all bodies. A material thing, like a hunk of res extensa. Yeah. No motion without bodies. No motion without material stuff. She's also, she's an atomist. We'll get to this eventually. In a f fine tradition of atomists. In fact, and she's not the first on the scene here with this either. Like Democritus, a notable at, like ancient atomist. She takes a particular approach that looks an awful lot like Epicurus or Epicurean atomism as well. We'll get to that eventually when we get to that side of the board. But yeah, so she says motion is not separable from matter. She says the same thing about place too, that place is not separable from matter or body. And the way that she talks about this is really interesting. I'm not sure if she's strawmanning some position. She's saying like, well, we couldn't say the opposite because how ridiculous is this? And the way that she talks about it is um, if place were separable from body, then every time I moved, I would be leaving my place behind me and then taking on a new place. And then I step away and I leave another place behind me. If I went like 100 miles, there would be this infinity of like places between my starting point and my stopping point that I like pick up and then drop and pick up and drop and pick up and drop and pick up and drop. And, up and, drop. and she says, that's just nutty. And same with motion too. Like motion is not... So when we talk about like things, here, we'll do this. Well, let's use, a, let's use a shitty marker that I don't intend to use. So when I like hit this with my hand and trans transfer the motion from my hand to the marker, is that what's actually happening? That motion is leaving my hand, going into the marker, and then the marker possesses the motion until it hits something else, and then it passes the motion on. Again, some of you might be thinking to yourself, like, I see some folks, Ben's going like, no, that's not true. I'm surprised there's nobody who's like going like, yeah, that's exactly what happens. <laughs> she does seem to, yeah, she doesn't have a concept of energy that she can work with. But yeah, a lot of this like transfer of motion, which she just kind of laughs at and kind of scoffs at and says like, transfer of motion, that's bananas. But if we're talking about transfer of energy, then we might reflect on like, this is exactly what I was taught in my high school physics class, is that energy gets transferred from one body to another, which then raises this question of like, so what the hell is energy? Is it immaterial? Is it supernatural? You can't see this thing. It magically transfers from one body to another, but it's just not available to the senses. Can there be motion apart from matter as well? It's just like motion hanging out, like waiting to go into matter? No, it has to have a cause. Yeah. One of the ways that we might kind of like approach this energy problem too is to say, Margaret Cavendish, no one's going to know this till the beginning of the 20th century, by the way. There's this guy, Einstein. He's like blows everybody's like mind with his big old brain and he says matter and energy are really the same thing and you can convert one to the other there's an equation for it as well i forget what it goes but um yeah there's a whole equation for figuring out how energy converts into matter something about the speed of light squared and yeah you can be a materialist and talk about the transfer of energy energy is just matter it's another profile of matter and this could work but she doesn't know that and so what's her metaphysics going to look like? This could be one way of thinking about this as some kind of like cool experiment of what does this approach to metaphysics and science look like if you don't have 20th century tools? But that also kind of just seems like a little bit like just a, like a funky little academic exercise. Like who cares? Who cares what science looks like without the tools that we have today? We do have the tools that we have today, so let's do contemporary science, not early modern science. Nobody learns early modern science except maybe historians. So why should we care? And one of the answers might be, I don't know that just this kind of like vague gesture towards energy solves the problem necessarily. It now needs us to like believe that somehow motion, not energy, but motion is still being transferred from one thing to another. Or that place is being transferred from one thing to another. Or that shape gets transferred from one thing to another. And these are kind of peculiar ideas. Margaret Cavendish's alternatives are, seem like no less peculiar, I think, to the contemporary eye. 
But I don't think she's at a significant disadvantage here not having those, those kind of like contemporary scientific tools. I think he's still got like a really weird and nasty problem on her hands. And it doesn't go away when you get to the 20th century. Motion, place, shape, all belong to bodies in the sense that she talks about. Her conversation about place in particular is really interesting. She says everything has a place and it never loses its place. Obviously, because place can't be separated from a thing. Everything has a place and it never loses its place and it never gets a new place. Places don't get transferred in and out of bodies. Places are kind of natural, necessary, essential aspects of bodies. Where she hits Descartes on this is she says, Descartes says motion is a mere mode of things. And Descartes does say that motion is a mode of things. I don't know about the mere part. And I don't know about saying that that means that motion is somehow separable from extended things. Maybe she's getting confused here because she thinks that motion is not essential to res cohetans. And Descartes does say that, that mind doesn't move. It might change, but it doesn't move in the sense of changing place. Because mind doesn't even have place, let alone motion with respect to place. But if we're just limiting this to kind of like res extensa, Descartes says that all bodies have place. He doesn't really say that place can get like removed from a body and put into another body. Either way, we still get led something to someplace interesting with this. If place is not something that can be taken away from something, what is place? Yeah, maybe. Place. Space? Are place and space the same thing? Places are in space? No, place is the term to refer to a particular a location in space. Occupied by a body. So space is not bodies. They can't have a place without a body. Is space immaterial? Is space supernatural? Space somehow outside of nature? Some of you might be thinking, like, the more I think about it, the more I'm thinking, like, you cannot analyze space with, like, naturalistic tools. You can't do a science of space. All the physicists are like, bullshit, watch me. <laughs> but if you do know anything about contemporary physicists, like, trying to give a physicalist approach or a physicalist account of, like, what space is, you'll know it's not considerably less weird than the shit that Margaret Cavendish is saying. What is space? Is space anything? In anybody's terms. Like, can you think about space as something? Is a space a something or is it a nothing? Because, like, yeah, if we go all the way back to the Eleatic monists, like, back, like, way, 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 way back, like, 6th century BCE, 4th century BCE, 5th century BCE? Yeah, 5th century BCE. Go back to folks like Parmenides who are going to say, look, and I said this earlier, that which is, is, and that which is not, is not, and cannot be. You can't say that that which is not, is. That's like the most basic of contradictions that you could possibly commit. So what's up with space? Is it or isn't it? Is it, a, is it an emptiness that is? Yeah. What the hell is that idea? Parmenides' student Zeno is going to drop another one on us that says like, hey, it seems like everything has some sort of location in space, right? Everything that is has some sort of location in space. What about space? Does space have a location in space? Shit. An abstract idea, not a material thing. So what are we talking about then, right? Stop talking about space. Doesn't make any sense. Place. Place belongs to material things. It's a property of material things. And if material things always have place and it can't be taken out of them, well, then what's going on here? What am I doing? She, just, she said there's motion. You're changing your place. I thought motion, yeah, I thought motion is, if I'm not mistaken, motion is like change in place over change in time. Sure, yeah. Change in place over change in time. That's motion. I'm holding the shitty marker that I was just going to hit and not do anything else with, but yeah. Delta place over delta time. 
that's motion, right? But now she's saying that place can't be changed. It, like, to change place would be to take place out of me and put another place into me. Is she making things unnecessarily difficult here? Well, she's saying specifically it can't be an object, right? Place can't be an object. And this is why it cannot be transferred from one body to another. The only way it could be transferred from one body to another is if it were a, an object. But it can't be an object. It has to be some sort of property of objects that can't be removed and kind of like moved around from thing to thing. So what then is, if place can't change, but apparently it needs to change, like what is going, like, and, and if you're thinking to yourself, like, I hope he makes sense of this soon for me because I'm confused, like, I'm right there with you. Yeah, Pearson. Keep working on it. If you find it, let me know. Corbin? Um, I disagree with uh, uh, Morgan's theory on place. Okay. Let's, well, let's make sure that we understand it before we disagree with it. I'm not sure if I do understand it, so I'm not sure if I disagree with it. But like, if you disagree with it, maybe that means you understand it. So let's start with what is it? What does she say about place? Um, so she gave an example that um, if it's a body's arm is removed, or if an arm is removed from the body, um, yeah. it still contains its own place no matter where it is. Yeah. Space. Yeah. Yeah, things take their place with them when they move despite the fact that movement seems like it's a changing of place, things take their place with them when they move. Do you take your place with you when you move? I can think of one way in which I totally take my place with me when I move. And if this is what Margaret Cavendish means, then there's a part of me that's kind of like, oh, yeah, maybe this is coming together. Where are you right now? Yes. Where are you right now? Here. Always. Like, go to the other side of the room. Where are you now? Here. You're always here. Like, everything, when she says everything has a place, maybe the way to think about it in such that, like, this place can never be removed from something and it never actually changes is everything's place, by the way, is here. Um, maybe it's like cheating, but if we can maintain this... If we can maintain that place is not space and that whatever it is that Margaret Cavendish is talking about when she talks about place is definitely not space because space seems to be like a thing that isn't but also is and this thing that like is, is it in itself or like what the hell is going on with space? Perhaps it's a thing that supernatural space appears to be an immaterial thing. Then whatever place is, it can't like... An immaterial thing can't belong to material bodies. That would be really, really weird. And space doesn't belong to bodies. Maybe bodies have locations in space, if you want to think about it like that. But Margaret Cavendish is raising a serious, like her entire view on this is raising serious objections to the notion of space as some sort of real, external, independently existing thing that's not material. And if place has to be a thing without this space, then maybe this is the only way to possibly make sense of it. And I think Margaret Cavendish is really onto something here. She's not the only one who's kind of like tracking this through that, that, that same sort of uh, thought process. Leibniz does a similar thing in his monadology. But you have to think, if there is no space, if there is no space, what is place? And it seems like maybe the best answer is, well, it's everything's here. Which isn't, to, which is to say that like there aren't some kind of like absolute locations that exist independently of all of the material things, and then the material things get into them, and now adopt one place and then leave it behind and then adopt another place. Whatever place is, and this isn't the end of the conversation, by the way. Here, this is the beginning of the conversation. This is the beginning of a construction of a whole weird metaphysics with, that talks about motion and change without space, presumably without time as well. Because what, what's everything's like temporal location? What's everything's temporal place? If your spatial place is always here, your temporal place is always no. now. And she even entertains, like, maybe it's a relational concept. Maybe place is, like, I'm directly in front of 
Corbin and slightly askew from Benjamin and then like a little bit even more askew from Sarah and a little bit more from Ryan. And like your place is defined in terms of your relationship to all of the other things that are around you. This is like one way that you could do it. And then she takes almost like a Heraclitian approach to this and says like, but all of those things are in constant motion. Like you'll never find the same place twice. The air is moving always. So like you're never going to find the exact same place or like you can't like leave a place and then come back to that place because all of the like it's not it's not relationally the same to all of the other things anymore. Those things have moved on and changed. Real puzzle here. What the heck is place going to be if there's no space? What the heck is motion going to be if there's no change of place? And what's going on with shape as well? She talks about shape supposedly being transferred from one thing to another. Gives a really great analogy of this too, by the way. She says, like, if you lay down in the snow and then get back up and you look back at the snow, what have you left behind you? You've left behind your imprint. You have not, by the way, left behind your shape. How do I know this? Because I still have my shape. I didn't like lose shapeliness when I laid down in the snow. If I did, like if I was leaving my shape behind, I would have less shape when I got back up, right? It's the same with motion and with place. If I leave place behind, then I'm going to have less of it as I move on. Or I'm going to have less motion as I pass something. Ooh, that one actually does sound like it might work. <laughs> but yeah, shape. And the interesting transition that she starts to make when she starts talking about shape that kind of brings all of these together is it seems like all of this stuff is talking about causation. We're trying to figure out like how it is that causation works with just matter. And it's harder than it looks. Princess Elizabeth says, seems easier to me to imagine the soul as res extensa. And now we're seeing like what that l begins to look like, soul as just res extensa. No immaterial things in the universe at all. Everything is material. And as soon as we start losing things like space and time, Suddenly it's just like, whoa, whoa, the world just got really, really weird. She's trying to figure out what causation looks like. And in particular, when, we, when she starts having this conversation about shape, the issue of mental causation comes onto the scene. Because she starts talking about that leaving your shape behind in the snow as a metaphor for perception more generally. That mental causation, especially if minds are matter, Mental causation is something akin to something leaving its impression. Now, that's the wrong way to say it, right? Because things don't leave their shape. But the way that we might talk about it, if we weren't being careful, is something leaves its impression on the matter of the mind, whatever that might be. It patterns itself out. She talks about a sort of like a passive activity of the material of the snow in the case of like leaving the snow angel. She says, the snow conforms around the body and takes on its shape. The body doesn't leave its shape behind. The snow conforms to, it patterns out the shape of the body and it holds on to that pattern. Then when the body leaves it, like there the pattern is still. And it doesn't seem to have anything that kind of holds that pattern together because as the wind blows, it kind of goes away and it dissolves and becomes more dissolute. And this is true of bodies too. Once like, whatever sort of life principle that keeps them together and stops them from disintegrating goes away, you don't stay together in your shape for very long. You turn into kind of like a gooey, gloopy mess, worm food, basically, right? Mental causation. So this is like, essentially what this is all trying to aim towards is some sort of physicalist account of how it is that like motion and place and causation work, but it's got to be consistent with mental causation. It's got to be consistent with a theory of perception. And a theory of perception where the mind is material. And this ends up being like totally fascinating. And the sort of thing that like any sort of empiricist or any sort of materialist or physicalist is going to have to like offer some sort of account of. There's a whole lot of hand waving of like, yeah, so there are like physical interactions between the world and my body, and that causes an imprint of like the world on my mind, and then I have thoughts, and they're like, whoa, 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 this like is more complicated than that. There are all kinds of little gaps that need to be filled that include things like what sort of matter is this mind that it can like take on the shape of things that like impinge upon me. <laughs> 
I have an idea, I make a noise, that noise makes air molecules vibrate, they fly through the air, vibrating, 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 vibrating. They hit your eardrum, vibrating, vibrating. It causes some kind of like neural impulse that eventually gets to your brain. And then like, does, is, it, is it just a slightly more complicated version of the snow angel? But like your mind is the snow? Peculiar, no? How do we make sense of this? She's not, and as I have mentioned before, she's not first on the scene here. Aristotle gets into this pickle towards the end of book three of On the Soul. He starts talking about like, yeah, what is the, the mind that hasn't thought any thoughts yet? What's that? What's, what is that? Does it have some sort of material and it's just waiting to be formed? And one way that Margaret Cavendish tries to offer an answer to this for us is through this kind of atomistic account where she says, look, when I say that all things are matter, I mean that like all things are material, right? All things are divisible, perhaps up until this smallest sort of thing, these atoms, these atomos things, these uncuttables, the smallest bits of matter that you can't cut them any smaller, which are constantly in motion, but motion not as a change in place because everything always carries its place with it just like it carries all of its essential properties with it. If it lost those, then it wouldn't be itself anymore. Margaret Cavendish says, there are more than one kind of atom, by the way. There are animate, or instead of atoms, we'll talk about matter. Animate matter. And she also says there's inanimate matter. And she says, everything in the world is made up of a mixture of these two things. Animate matter, by the way, can be subdivided into two other categories. I think this was a reading quiz question. What are they? There's, yeah, there's animate matter that's rational. And then what's the other one? Sensitive. The sensitive animate matter is kind of passive. If you're wondering, like, so what is this kind of like taking on the pattern of something else in this way that, like, you're not moving yourself necessarily, but you're being moved by something else, but that being moved by something else can't be a transfer of motion from that thing to you because then motion would have to leave things and then go into other things, and we're talking about how that won't work. The only way this will work is if there's a particular kind of moving matter and the way that it moves is it takes on the motion of other things that it comes into contact with. And then there's another form of moving matter that moves itself, that like isn't in relation to other things, it just kind of like moves itself. And she thinks of these as like distinct different kinds of atoms. In fact, I probably should have done this in all sorts of different colors so that we can keep track of this. But let's call the rational ones blue and the sensitive ones red and the inanimate matter green. And she'll basically say something like this. Any per well, I don't want to use another color because all there is is these three kinds of atoms. She says, any person or any object, really, for that matter, is just made up of all these atoms. And some of them are inanimate. And some of them are animate and rational. And some of them are animate and sensitive, the kind of passive moving atoms. And your soul basically is these animate atoms or this animate matter that suffuse throughout the entirety of your body. This is an interesting approach to soul. I think it's got it's got the goods on some on Descartes' approach in some pretty interesting ways. One of the big problems that Descartes had with the soul is this question of like, where is the soul? And Descartes has to say, there is no where for the soul. Res extensa has where. Res cohitans does not have where. But if you think about this a little bit, and I think we have talked about this a little bit, do you have a where? Because I kind of think I do have a where. If somebody says, where are you, Adam? I'm not like, that's nonsense. I'm a thinking thing, and thinking things don't have where. I say I'm here. 
or I'm in Ferguson on the third floor or something like that, right? I, I have some kind of like way of describing where I am. Am I just at my pine? Am I like riding around in the pineal gland? Yes. Margaret Cavendish gives a slightly better metaphor than the ship captain. I think this was also on the reading quiz. The spider in the web. Every time something touches the web, the spider is like, "Ooh, I'm on top of that." That's way better than the ship and captain. <clears throat> But one of the things that we mentioned when we were kind of casually talking about this, like, where are you question, yeah, like, I'm in my brain, I'm behind my eyes, and like, well, not always. Sometimes you're kind of like elsewhere in your body. Sometimes metaphorically I'll say, like, where are you now? And like, I don't know, I'm someplace else. Like, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Like, how can you be someplace else? You're always here, right? Everything's always here. But this is an interesting way it kind of, takes the soul and it spreads it out throughout the entire body. It doesn't try to locate it in any one particular place. This is the Epicurean approach, by the way. Like I said, she's not first on the scene. Epicurus takes this approach. He says, Democritus is right about the atoms, and then there are like soul atoms, and they're all over your body. And furthermore, Margaret Cavendish says, it's not just humans, by the way, that are like this. Animals, too, are a mixture of rational, sensitive, and inanimate matter. And not just animals, and this is when she starts kind of like leaning in a very interesting direction. She basically leaves the door open to and flirts pretty heavily with this prospect that everything has some animate matter in it. Everything. The word for this, by the way, if you haven't heard it before, is panpsychism. And it's not 100% for sure, for sure that Margaret Cavendish was a panpsychist, but boy does she leave the door wide open for it and seems an awful lot like she's talking some panpsychist talk. Panpsychism is the idea that everything has a mind. Like everything thinks. When we say matter thinks and everything's matter, everything thinks. Now some of that thinking is super duper low level thinking. Like I think, I think in some pretty profound ways. Especially with the help of, you know, some other thinkers. Some other thinkers. Some other thinkers. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, I say, yeah, coral reef. Does it think? Not in the sense that Descartes wants to talk about thinking things, but it doesn't need to be so damn special. My dog thinks a little bit less than me, but a little bit more than coral. Coral thinks maybe a little bit more than a virus. What about a rock? Does a rock think? <laughs> Dumb rocks. Consider this. Two rocks floating in space. Nothing else around. What's going to happen to those two rocks? They're going to float? They're just going to continue floating? They're hanging in space. Yeah, what was that, Pearson? They're going to come together. Why are they going to come together? Because of gravity? Did they perceive one another? Can we talk about like a sort of sensitive, animate matter in them that kind of says like, ah, another rock. <laughs> Let's go. I don't know if rocks think, but if rocks did think, it would be a very, very basic, like proto sort of thing. If a rock thinks while it's falling... It's just going like, falling! That's like all it's doing. It's just falling, going, falling, falling. It's not even saying, I'm falling. It doesn't, rocks don't have an eye. They're not aware of themselves. But this is the sort of panpsychist approach that it seems like Margaret Cavendish is starting to play around with. And it's a natural extension of her approach that she's kind of working through here, which in turn seems to be a, that's all right, I'm running late, which in turn seems to be a natural extension of this really, really simple decision, which Princess Elizabeth introduces for us, which is to say, let's just say everything is matter. And when she just says it like that, you're like, good idea. And then when we see like, what that looks like, it's like, oh, shit, that's really weird to just say that everything's matter. We're going to pick up the extension of this empiricist sort of tradition with John Locke at our next meeting. Keep eyes peeled for reading and reading quiz.